My next guest is Stephanie Rothstein. Stephanie is an educational leader focused on making education more collaborative and less competitive. She advocates for modeling the risks we expect of our students and shared about this in her TEDx talk, The Year of Yes to Me, published on TED.com. In her 18 plus years in education, Stephanie has taught grades 9 through 12 English yearbook AVID and chaired the LEAD Design Thinking Pathway at Los Gatos High School for 10 years. Stephanie is a certified administrator and currently serving as the Ed Tech TOSA for Santa Clara Unified School District, a K-12 district supporting 15,500 students and over 1,000 teachers at 31 schools. Stephanie's continuous love of learning led her to become a Google innovator, trainer, and coach. She is a founder of Global GEG, the creator of Can We Talk EDU, and the author of numerous articles published on Edutopia and her own blog. Her chapter in Because of a Teacher was published in August 2021, and her chapter in the 100 Stop Leader Series will be published in the spring of 2022. She speaks at educational conferences around the world and was named CUE's Teacher of the Year for 2021. Welcome to the podcast, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, tell me what the CUE uh, organization is. Oh yeah, sure. So Q um, is, it stands for computer using educators. Although I think most, most just refer to it as Q all the time. Okay. Um, I actually have their little card up here behind me, um, but they're wonderful. They put on a, a lot of conferences and do a ton of support. Um, they're mostly here in the Western region. So mm -hmm. California, I think Nevada, Oregon, like all, all around this part. Um, and they organize different conferences. I would say very similar if you participate in ISTE, like it draws a lot of the same crowd of people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a really wonderful supportive. There are regional groups for it, similar to um, GEG groups, but, but um, Q is organized. A lot of it is geared at technology specifically um, and how to better yourself as a teacher in the classroom. So any and all of that. And I have met so many wonderful people there and I feel quite lucky. Um, it was such a surprise. I didn't even know anything about it. And I, all of a sudden I got an email um, and it was, it was quite an honor. So it was wonderful, even though it wasn't in person. Um, and they just, they were just so sweet. So um, they did like a whole video. It was wonderful. And I got to meet all the different people who were honored from their area. People get honored by their region. And then from there, it gets selected for the whole Q organization. So mm -hmm. it was it, like, what a nice surprise for that crazy yeah. year of 2021. Yeah, to get selected as teacher of the year is definitely an honor <laughs> in this day and age uh, after a difficult year. But let's talk about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. Oh my goodness, I'd be happy to. So one of the things that I wrote about in my chapter in Because of a Teacher, mm -hmm. my section in that book, um, my chapter was housed in the section of what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? Mm -hmm. And I found that during that first year of teaching, there were a lot of moments where I would say I was in the trenches. There were moments where I felt totally alone, alone in a space, alone in my classroom. And I was really scared about asking for help and looking stupid. Mm -hmm. I really, I didn't want people to think I didn't no stuff. I didn't want to get fired. I didn't, yeah. I thought I was supposed to come in and be ready and know it all. And it took me going through many more years in that first year to realize like, actually, you never know it all. And you're mm -hmm. learning every single day and to feel okay about that, that I help yeah. students to feel okay about it, but how to feel okay myself. So I think it took, it took me a good long while, but um, to get out of that trench, I learned to start to ask questions to the teacher across the hall from me. Um, they started to share pieces. I learned to start to post things a little bit more. Like I wasn't using things on social media. I started going to more conferences or connecting with people and they shared things out. And I became more confident to share what I was doing and then start to ask questions. And I became less shy about showcasing what I'm doing in my room. And it helped me mm -hmm. to feel less alone because then people went, oh, I like that idea. Can we partner up? Can we do this? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that for me was the biggest part because when I was teaching my students, I felt like it was like relationship wise, I was good. But mm -hmm. what I 
what I needed to work on was how to build a relationship and rapport with the staff at my school where they actually got to know me and where I connected with them, where I felt safe to ask questions. So that was what got me out of the trenches was feeling like I could ask questions and feel safe to do so in a space. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of uh, new teachers resonate with that because they're finding their place, right? And they they don't want to mess up. They don't want to look like they don't know <laughs> things, uh, but it is safe to ask. And yeah, to actually find that uh, space where you're able to then uh, showcase things in your room, uh, connect with colleagues. It, it does take a couple of years at the beginning uh, because you kind of have to feel comfortable, right? And have the confidence, yeah. I think. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the book, uh, Because of a Teacher. You said there were 15 uh, different people collaborated on this. Oh and, gosh, um, I feel so, I feel so lucky yeah. to be in it. Um, <laughs> it was a really, it's been a really beautiful process actually. So George Koros basically curated the book. He wrote some chapters in it as well. And if you're not familiar with George, you should be. Um, and he wrote The Innovator's Mindset and mm -hmm. many other things. Um, and um, so the authors, um, it's organized, there's 15 of us, as you mentioned, it's organized in three sections. And so okay. the sections, the sections really are about showing gratitude in many ways. So the first one is who is a teacher who inspired you and why mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the second is who's an administrator who inspired you and why. And then the third is the section I wrote in, what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? Okay. And so the idea is that by looking back um, on people who have inspired us. And some people wrote about teachers and administrators that inspired them when they were students. Others wrote about people who inspired them when they were also in the classroom. So it's really a different perspective, but it's really about showcasing what, what sticks with you, what is meaningful mm -hmm. that we can learn from as teachers, as administrators, as leaders on a campus. And then if you are new in the profession or newer or need, need some moments to be inspired, looking back on that advice and figuring out from that, that last section, really understanding like, oh gosh, that's helped me grow. I learned so much from reading all of the other people in that section of the book as well and mm -hmm. throughout the entire book. Um, it really helped me to see what other people value as meaningful. Um, and just in my own current role, it helped me to go, oh, like that, those moments of interaction really matter to people or mm -hmm. when somebody does this for someone else or showcases or shares out or honors them in this way, it just, it helped provide me a different perspective about how to some of the goals I want to set for myself in my own leadership journey as well. So there's a ton, I think, no matter where you are in your own educational journey that people can get out of the book. So I'm really proud of it and I'm happy to be a part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think uh, you talked a little bit in the pre-chat about um, it's helping educators go back to their why, uh, because, you know, there's a ways through, um, you know, it, it kind of it, through the tough times, right? Yes. Um, but it does approach things through an administrative lens, kind of, you said. There's there's some parts that I think if you're an administrator, it would appeal to you. If you're a teacher, it will appeal to you. So I think it's for anyone involved in education. Okay. Um, and the way that when we were all writing it, the way that George described it to us was he said he wanted it to be like a chicken soup for the teacher soul, that yeah. it's filled with stories that will help to inspire us to keep going, that this has been a pretty trying time to say the yeah, least definitely. for everyone in education. <laughs> and so I think it's hard, um, it, it's hard to not have something to go to um, that can inspire you. And so I think that the stories in here are meant to do that, that they're, they're meant to be pieces that they don't sugarcoat things. They talk about things that are really challenging and really hard, but they also talk mm -hmm. about what we learned from it. Like, it doesn't mean that we were happy that something that was difficult happened, but what did we learn from it and yeah. how did we grow and who are we now because of it? So I mm -hmm. think it takes a really honest look at moments and moments that we can all learn from and by sharing them out, hopefully other people can learn from them as well. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your current role. Um, so you said this is the first year as a TOSA. Uh, so you're supporting ed tech in your district. Yeah, this is my first year in this particular district. So I'm, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, I'm at Santa Clara Unified. Um, and this is my first time being in a K-12 district. Prior okay. to that, like all the other 18 years of my career, I've been um, just in a 
high school only districts, which is yeah. something I don't know if other places outside of California have that. Um, and so that's new. And my role is new in that it is very specific that my job as a TOSA teacher on special assignment is specifically supporting educational technology. Okay. So prior to it, um, I had always um, been balancing my role as a, as a TOSA. I also was in the classroom. So this is my very first year stepping out of the classroom um, and supporting people with ed tech. So what I often am doing is I'm working at the school site level. I work with principals. Um, they'll bring me in if there's a particular initiative that they want. I'll do walkthroughs with principals where we will talk about areas or areas of gap or areas of growth on a campus where they would like to see or spark innovation in a particular area. So, um, for instance, I was working with a principal and, and one of the questions I asked, he kept saying, I really, I want our school to like showcase all the greatness. And so one of the questions I asked was, does your school do video announcements? And mm -hmm. he said, <laughs> no, actually we don't. So that was an, that was an in, right? Where I could say, well, is that an area where we could begin? Do you potentially have a media lab? If you don't, can we build an outside space? Could we paint a wall somewhere? I painted a wall at our district resource center to showcase how you could do that in a small space um, and how you can do it really on a budget or if you have a bigger budget, how we can do it. But it's really about inspiring some creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and once that gets sparked, then people, they wanna either use a space or they wanna do a thing that that inspires them to do. Um, so my role is to help make some of this technology feel less intimidating. I, I, that's ultimately how I see it because I did not, I am not someone that went to school to be in tech. So my role, I've always been in the classroom. As mentioned, I taught yearbook. And so that brought technology into my life because I ended up teaching video yearbook. I had always liked graphic design. Mm -hmm. I ended up finding like I learned some of these things quickly and I was um, inquisitive about it. And I went to classes if I didn't know how to do something. And I just wanted to grow that. I was often that yes person where, oh, this is a new thing. Let's try it out. Like I was willing to try yeah. it. So I think that attitude has served me well. It's what led to this role essentially. And then I just kept trying things. And so now really my perspective is teacher first. Um, and what is it that you want to do? What do you hope to accomplish in your classroom? How do we connect better with students? And how can technology be a way to support doing that? Doing mm -hmm. it either more efficiently, more effectively, like what are the ways that technology can help get you to your goal and increase students wanting to participate and do it and help them learn life skills along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned uh, you'd like to do something with design thinking in the future. I absolutely, so absolutely love design thinking. Um, I chaired a design thinking pathway mm -hmm. for over 10 years um, that you had mentioned the lead pathway. So um, ultimately I would absolutely love as I move to probably towards being in administration in some mm -hmm. way, working or doing things at a, at a school that is a design thinking school or project-based learning school, depending mm -hmm. on what the vernacular is that's being used. I love supporting people through the process of design thinking. I often do workshops with teachers, with staff, with other educators um, on guiding themselves through a design thinking process. I use it both in my own life. Um, mm -hmm. I use it for things that I'm thinking about doing. And I also use that process for designing things in, in a classroom. I use it with students. So I have found that to be a really um, freeing and innovative process um, that, that has some guide guides for students and it works at every grade level. It's just, it's a, it's a process of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it's helped give, give me anyway, the terminology that can be used with students to help and to help staff better understand how do we actually do something that serves the needs of other people. So that's the reason why I think I absolutely love design thinking because it's about serving the needs of others, mm -hmm. not just what I need. Right. So it's about what is who is the end user? How do I discover what they actually need and how do I build something to support that physical or otherwise? Um, and so whatever that is. Right. If I'm creating a lesson, I'm thinking about the end user, the student. Mm -hmm. Right. If you go through the design thinking process, it helps you get there. So um, we use the design thinking process when 
Um, I was at Google Innovator to help develop our project. Mm -hmm. um, I used it when I went to, I was lucky enough to go to Stanford's D school, the design school at Stanford to take their training with some of the other teachers and in, um, in my pathway that I chaired. So it just is something that I is very close to my heart. And so no matter what I end up doing, I think it's a methodology that I will continue, continue to use in my practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can really tell your passion uh, for for that type of uh, work with the students and, you know, how it does free them to pursue their interests, um, you know, stepping away from the regular, um, you know, just a lot of what we're, what we're doing in classrooms today. I know there are a lot of uh, schools that are moving more towards PBL and design thinking, but yeah, hopefully you'll um, be able to continue your work with that. And wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, on your website, uh, there's a, a lot of videos <laughs> that just uh, talk about uh, some of the different uh, trainings that you give and presentations uh, that you've had for a conference breakout sessions. So talk to me a little bit about uh, both those, um, some of these highlighted trainings uh, on your website, but also the TEDx talk um, sure. and how kind of all that, um, also led you, you said, to working with George Kiros on the It book. really did. It <laughs> yeah. really did. So um, the TEDx talk, it was so interesting. I went to Google Innovator, and when I came back from Innovator, um, I mean, that's its own story. So when I, but yeah. when I came back from Google Innovator in Singapore, the students at my previous school, um, they hosted, there was a group of students from an organization, they called themselves UP, Unconditionally po Positive, and they hosted every year a TEDx event at the school where they would invite outside people to come and speak, and they would often find at least one, one teacher at the school that they would want to highlight, sometimes two, and they asked, they asked me if I would give a presentation. So I said yes, and what I talked about in my talk entitled The Year of Yes to Me was the fact that I went off to, I wanted to pursue Google Innovator, and I wanted to pursue some journeys in my own career that um, I needed to get permission a little bit. I wanted to get permission, I should say, from my husband and my three children, like, can I can I start to do and pursue some of these things that perhaps I've put on the back burner for mm -hmm. a really long time? Um, because I'm happily a mom and a teacher and all of these things, but could I start to do that? Could I start to put myself out there and speak more and write more and share more? And they weren't things that I was doing before. Mm -hmm. um, and so my talk was really about the journey of doing that and how I learned how, how to make time for that and how I analyzed what led me or what helped me to feel more confident in doing so. And I talked about four, four pieces that kind of got me there on that journey. And really the talk was about that I ask students to take risks every day in my classroom. And I asked them to put themselves out there and to try and that I needed to be doing that more. And so I wanted to model those, that risk mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. getting up there and talking about it and taking these bigger leaps in my own life and career. So that when I said for students to try, they could see that I was modeling it myself. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one. And then giving that talk kind of led to other pieces. I, you know, here I am a teacher in my own school, in my own classroom, starting to put my work out there. And then I had others coming to me and saying, you know, you should write more, you should share more, you should mm -hmm. give talks at conferences more. And it built up my my own confidence in being able to do that. I started to do that. And that led me to somehow getting into a conversation. I was at a, um, in an event with a, that another innovator had organized, Naomi Tolan, she's wonderful. And George Kuros was coming on for something. I came in, somehow we connected there. And mm -hmm. after he contacted me back, he said, I watched your TED talk. I looked up some things about you. I would love to interview you. After that interview, then he wrote me and he said, I would love, I've read some of your writing. Would you like to write in this book? Like things just, it, it like took, it was a path that I didn't know would happen. And so what I've realized is saying yes to a lot more things that maybe scared me before mm -hmm. have helped open me up, right? Like you saying, would you like to be interviewed? And me going, yes, that's because I'm being willing to, to put myself out there a little bit more. Probably if you had asked me a couple of years ago, I would have been like, no, no, but now that's part of what I'm loving doing. And it helps connect me with people um, and help me to learn. It helps me to learn. Um, 
The other things that are on the website are other talks that I've given at conferences. One that I love that I did with, um, with Becky Lim. She's wonderful. Um, she's now based in Chicago, but she used to be here in California. We, we were giving a talk about modeling expectations. So um, it was geared at administrators um, mm -hmm. in different districts and we gave it um, at a county presentation. We've given it at other conferences geared at administrators having really having administrators take a deep look at the way that you present when you're with staff and mm -hmm. how do you just the way that I was asking in my modeling expectations how do administrators model the expectations that they have of teachers mm -hmm. um, and when we were asking that of them we were giving them ways that they could incorporate in their presentations strategies that would model what they're asking teachers to do the way that they even organize a meeting to ask it that it models the way that teachers would organize a lesson um, and asking them to do some more innovative practices in the way that they deliver that so that it really is something that mirrors what they would want to go in and see and observe in a classroom mm -hmm. so um, and then other presentations I often give I give things that are geared I think at connection, mm -hmm. technology. Um, and I, I think the other the other piece is in leadership. So those tend to be my three areas of focus when I do talks or writing, um, because those are all things that I am passionate about. Um, and really thinking about pedagogy along with that with the, the when I say content, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you talked a bit about writing. And so you've had a blog for a while. Um, so what type of uh, topics do you tend to write about and um, how is your personal blog different than the articles that you're writing for Edutopia? Sure. So I did, you know, the personal blog that I started, it was so interesting because um, I really was a person that in my role as a TOSA in my previous district, I was often sending out emails to the whole staff mm -hmm. that guided them through a certain thing. And I was trying to help help them understand like this might be really useful to you and then I started to realize like my goodness all that I'm putting in this email mm -hmm. probably could just be a blog post and so yeah. <laughs> um but I had never thought about having a blog post or having my words just be somewhere that someone could look up so I started to put what I was putting in emails in blogs that's how I got started so if anybody hasn't started that that was my way of starting was going mm -hmm. let me copy that and just paste it and see how that does. Um, and I often found that what I was doing was taking things that teachers were asking me lots of questions about, or that I was sharing with colleagues, and that would get turned into a blog post. Mm -hmm. So my initial blogs were often on things like, how do I close um, meaningfully at the end of the school year? Or how do I set up groups in my classroom? Um, and how do I physically organize it? Like I had a special way that I would do groups with mm -hmm. charts with their pictures and how do, I, how do I do that? And so I would write about processes that help me and hopefully when people read it, it would save them time or would inspire a particular project since a lot of what I was doing was group project work. And so often what I was sharing was some of my reflections on how do we collaborate better? How can you help to support that in the classroom? Um, and then I found that um, I also started writing, as mentioned, I submitted and started to write some articles for Edutopia. Mm -hmm. So um, if anybody else is ever interested in writing for them, one of the things to know is you can't have written it on your own stuff before. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably notice if you go to my blog that there's like some gaps in when I started to write for them because I was a lot of my content ended up getting published there. Okay. Uh, and so I'm coming back, I would say there's some pieces, like if I know that it's something that in the future, I wanna save it, I wanna save it for a future book, or I wanna save it for something else that I could be doing and I wanna hold it, then I'll save it for my own blog. Um, if there's other stuff that's like current and it wouldn't work to refer to it later um, and is useful information then I'm, um, and I'm writing about that. Like one of the articles I wrote for Edutopia was um, reflections kind of um, in this pandemic era, like mm -hmm. reflections on what I learned from being virtual that then I took back into the classroom and um, what are things that I would hold on to that I learned from that. Another topic that I wrote about there was, um, I wrote a recent one with Lauren Kaufman that was on um, specific professional learnings that we can do for guiding our own professional learning. So I think that if something is 
current for me, right? And like, it, it's a right now piece, I'll write it for Edutopia if it's mm -hmm. a piece that I want to refer to or, um, um, or that I, yeah, that I'm thinking about for other stuff, um, I'll save it. So that's how I distinguish the two um, for me. Um, and so I'm starting to get back to, I'll get back to my own blog soon enough. I find I have to be, I'm quick with writing, but I have to be really mm -hmm. inspired. Like, I have a lot sitting in the queue that I've started. Yeah. And if I don't finish it right then, then it never becomes a blog post. Cause I'm like, hmm, that was an uninspired one. Like I, you know, I had an idea, but if it didn't go anywhere, I'm not somebody where I come back to it. Like I often am like, oh, that's an idea. Let me just like write it out and go. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's my own process of writing. So um, the things that inspire me to write are the things that I am living or observing. And so I'm lucky enough to be in a job where I get to observe and support a lot of people. And that's led to me having lots of epiphany. It's like, yeah. oh, why didn't I do that in my own classroom for years? What he just did was beautiful. You know, let me write about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I mentioned in the bio that you are writing a chapter for the hundred things that all leaders should stop doing. And I wrote a chapter for the teacher's book. And so you're uh, writing the next book. Uh, chapter for the next book that is coming out in the spring. So uh, what is the title of your chapter and kind of um, what what are some of the questions you ask in that? Yeah. Chapter? Okay. So I'm probably going to misquote the actual title of the chapter, but the premise of my chapter, how about we say it that way so yeah. that I'm not wrong, <laughs> but the premise of my chapter was about um, how leaders should, should stop asking staff to, to, do tasks that lead to nowhere. Okay. Um, and so a lot of what I uh, wrote about for that particular chapter was that there are some things that often are like checkoffs um, mm -hmm. or that if we, and I find it happens a lot in meeting time. So I focused my chapter a lot on the way that we actually use our time being together. Cause I guess for me, if we're gonna like, gosh, after this time of pandemic, if we're gonna mm -hmm. take all this time to actually either be physically together or virtually together in a space, like it should be meaningful time. Yeah. And what you asked me to do in that time should actually matter. Like it shouldn't just be that I'm giving my, my thoughts or my opinion and I'm writing it on some paper that goes nowhere and doesn't do anything for anyone. So um, I, I think that what we are asked of, like we should figure out a way that what we are doing in those moments where we get to be in a space with other adults really matter and make impact. And so that's what I ended up writing about in my chapter. It's how to, how to shift those times um, and those moments where often they, they lead to nowhere to leading to somewhere instead. So mm -hmm. that's my hope. Well, looking forward to that coming out. And I know that Rick Jetter had a call for the parents book recently. So he is um, plugging away at getting those. Gosh, he's on the move with yes. these. Yes, <laughs> authors like... set up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, out of everything we talked about today on the podcast, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? I think I would like, even when you gave my, in, when you gave my intro, I always have it in there, but I have a personal, how might we, I, like, I know we talked about me being a design thinking person. So mm -hmm. I have a personal, how might we statement that kind of guides me in everything that I do. And it's how might we make education more collaborative and less competitive. Mm -hmm. And it really is something that it guides the projects I pick. It guides the work I do. It got, it, it really does guide me because I don't think that education for students or for staff there should not be a competition. Everyone should have the ability to have and experience greatness in their classroom and in their educational experience. And I, I don't think that that should be something that needs to be argued about. And I really want to be able to support people in providing goodness everywhere and greatness everywhere um, because students deserve it. And so do teachers and educators and administrators. So that is my hope is that we can support one another to make that possible. That's so important to remember. Uh, where can people connect with you and find you online? You can find me on Twitter. And that's where I'm most active um, is Twitter at Steph Roth, R-O-T-H-E-D-U. Um, you can also find same handle for Instagram. Um, and then that is also my website. So stephrothedu.com. I tried to make it easy. Um, and my website 
has lots of the projects that I've done. So um, as you mentioned, right, it has my Can We Talk stuff, which is another piece, another time we can talk that, mm -hmm. but it has links to all the things and different projects that I've done um, for Innovator and other things that I, and all of the writings that you mentioned. So it has links to my blog on there as well. Great, I'll link that in the show notes and um, hope listeners will access those things because there is a plethora of materials, a uh, very um, impressive uh, array of <laughs> just videos and different things to look through. So it's been a pleasure to have you on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. You too.